Well, hello and good evening, everyone. And I want to welcome you to a super special edition of our Arizona History Happy Hour. So because it's June, we're actually doing a Pride special. So we're going to have a lot of fun this evening. We have our special guest, Pussy Lahoot, as well as all kinds of other bits of random Arizona LGBTQ history. So just sit back, relax, and enjoy yourselves. Now, I want to welcome you all. So we've been doing this now. This is actually our 11th show that we've been doing right here via Facebook Live and other streams. So really started doing this as a way because I realized, you know, I was really missing getting out in the community, talking to folks and sharing stories and just having a good time with folks and learning that exchange, which wasn't really happening at this moment. So it really was a chance to kind of jump into that and get a chance to chat with folks and continue learning about Arizona because the stories are endless. So I want to welcome you all tonight. And so this is made possible through donations from folks just like you. Now, if you'd like to, you can find me on Venmo under Marshall Shore. Um, I also would like to thank our sponsor, ARP. So the coronavirus continues to affect us all. We may be apart, but we are not alone. ARP is here in Arizona providing information that can help you and your family. You can find them at the website www.arp.org backslash AZ. And so you can find out about more information right there. And so tonight we'll be doing, we'll have our special guest, Pussy Lahoot. We'll also be doing some really fun trivia as well as Little Arizona and some music history and even things from my very own collection. So my name is Marshall Shore. I will be your host this evening. I'm also known as the Hip Historian. Now you might wonder, how does one get a name like the Hip Historian? Well, you know, a little over 20 years ago, I was working in a library in Brooklyn. And you know what? It was bitterly cold outside. I was ready for a change. And so, decided to load everything we own into a big orange cube, a U-Haul. And you know, they have the World International Headquarters right here in downtown Phoenix. And we promptly moved into a 1956 ranch. Now, when we got it, it was beige on beige on beige. And I keep going on with all the tones of beiges. I'm happy to say now, it is a lovely seafoam and cantaloupe. Much more simpler, and I think much more beautiful. There's what my kitchen looks like today. All that buttercream yellow tile with the matching yellow in the wall oven. Now, as soon as I got here from New York, all I kept hearing about how there was no history. But I knew that wasn't true because every time I went somewhere, came face to face with so many amazing stories. Then you have that post-war boom. All those GIs that after World War II moved here because they had either were stationed here, trained here, or passed through on their way to somewhere else. And they were moving here in huge numbers after the war, looking for a new way of life, and in some cases, a home just like mine. Now we have this man, Dr. Carrier, the inventor of air conditioning, who I'm sure on a day like today, we're very happy that he brought his invention to the desert and got us away from just conditioned air or swamp coolers. Also, the Phoenix New Times has named me best historian several years running, as well as Phoenix Magazine named me the best bespectacled Phoenix celebrity because I do like my eyewear. Now you might wonder, what is Marshall wearing? Because I have my own idea of what I think looks good. Now, you might remember every year on February 14th, we have a celebration for ourselves on Statehood Day or Valentine's Day, as other folks call it. 
But back in 2012, we celebrated 100 years of statehood. And so there were events across the state and including right in front of the Capitol. And so someone gave me 15 minutes on that main stage, like about anything I wanted to. And so it was a really started by Charlotte Hall back in 1926. And she was the first poet laureate. If you're ever in, up in Prescott, you can go visit her home, which was also home to ter ter territorial governors. The event was called Mask of the Yellow Moon. It was based on an event about how the God of Sun would give his rays to make the earth golden and warm and just make things grow. So it was always a springtime event. It was first held at the Elsie Beer Shriners Temple, which is over just down by the Capitol over on 15th Avenue in Washington. Now the building still stands. It became the Mining and Mill Museum, but you know, they got kicked out, but happily this cute little quirky museum is gonna be moving right back into this same space in a few years once they get the building brought back up to code. It was first held, then it, from there it moved over to Montgomery Stadium which was our first stadium right here in Arizona. And it was also home to our very first bowl game, which was called the Salad Bowl. Now, what would you expect from the Salad Bowl? Why none other than the queen of the Salad Bowl arriving on a float in her very own custom-made salad bowl with a spoon and fork even to serve with. Now, the Mass Villa Moon ran from 1926 to 1955. At its height, it had about 5,000 high school and college students involved in it. It was touted right there with Mardi Gras as something that everyone in the country should come and see. And many folks did from across the state and elsewhere. Now, because it was put on by the high schools, it was woven through the curriculum. So everybody got involved while you had the debate club doing skits. You had multiple marching bands and these really large sets. And then there was also the costumes that were designed by Home Ec and made by students as well. And I was lucky enough to find a few of those in a box. And so I was able to convince three lovely friends to don these late thirties dresses and wear them on stage. And so you might've guessed, I'm not a very good wallflower. So I need something to stand up to those dresses. And so I talked to my friend, Glenn. Now, Glenn is in his early 90s now. He rolled in town the early 50s as a sign designer. And here he is accepting a Wall of Fame award from the Arizona Sign Association, talking about signage across Arizona. One of the signs that he designed, you might be familiar with, the My Florist sign. But he designed a handful of signs that are still standing. And so he painted this suit coat for me, which was his homage to the Arizona state flag. It then got me going on a jag where, you know, why just have one suit coat based on a theme when you can have multiple? And for the first time in 11 episodes, we're going to get a costume change. But one of the reasons why I like to tell this story is because you never know where the next story is coming from. And so I was doing a presentation for the Arizona's first families. And afterwards, a woman came up to me, tapped me on the shoulder, took me out to her car and pulled this dress out. Now, this dress was her mother's dress that she wore in the Mask of Yellow Moon. Now, we know it's from either 1928 or 29 because she had programs. But I really want to get a chance to take a look at those programs when I can really touch them and go through them and see exactly what number and what year this dress was worn in. I mean, for being from the late 20s, it's an amazing condition. Look at the vibrant color of those butterflies still there after all these years. Now, because it is Arizona happy, History Happy Hour, of course, we do have a cocktail. And in honor of Pussy Lahoot, I know she likes margaritas. So we decided to do a little margarita. And let's see if this works. All right. So. We need our two ounces of tequila. All right, so. There we go. 
Those child-proof bottles, who knew? All right. And then we need our one ounce of fresh lime juice, which I just squeezed a little bit ago. And then we want a little bit of Cointreau. And a little dash of some simple syrup just to help sweeten it up. We'll give that a good stir. I'm not a big fan of shaking things, or at least my cocktails. All right, so there indeed we do have our margarita. Oh, dang, that is oh so tasty. So again, thank you all for being here. Now, if you're all if you're viewing this on Facebook Live, if you wouldn't mind clicking the share button, so that way other folks can see how much fun we're going to be having this evening because we're going to have a blast. Now, before I bring on Pussy, I would like to switch out jackets from my Arizona jacket. to a very lovely rainbow, since indeed it is Pride Month. Well, hello, Pussy, how are you doing? Hello, I'm doing great, how are you? Uh-oh. Good. How's your night going so far? Well, pretty good considering everything that's going on in the world and in Arizona. <laughs> I am here all by myself at my studio at my home. And I'm not the technologically With a very fancy background. Well, that's my stage here at Pusscat Studios. And I'm trying to get situated. I usually have a little crew with me, but tonight I'm all alone. So I'm trying to do all this and we rehearsed setting up, but like a dummy, I didn't do it on my iPhone, which I usually film with. I did it with my other phone. So I'm having all kinds of things. So I think uh, you, can, you can see me and hear me. We're good. I don't think I'm getting, I don't think anyone can see me on Facebook um, from my people. I have people like texting me right now, like we can't find you. So I don't know where to go. But um, I'm here. I'm here. All right. Very yeah, good. Yeah, I don't know how. I, I don't think I can switch two phones. I've got one going over here and one over here. Hi. Who's ever saying hi? Good to see you. Well, anyway, I'm, I'm here. And I have a margarita myself. I have a strawberry margarita that my friend dropped off. Oh, nice. You have really good friends. No one dropped off a cocktail for me. Oh, yes, honey. They make deliveries every week. Some of my old... Uh, bar owners and friends. <laughs> I got a care package yesterday with this big bottle of Cuervo Margarita strawberry from Bill Jackson. He used to own the Wave and the Padlock. And my sponsors at El Himador brought me some. So I might even have a shot of tequila during the little festivities tonight. <clears throat> ah, very good. I like your background. I like the rainbow. I need something <laughs> like that over here. It's just green screen. That's nothing that fancy. Uh, well, I don't even have a green screen. I have blue and silver. <laughs> 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 and I just realized I didn't even get my fingernails on yet. But since I haven't been doing anything but sitting at home, they've kind of grown anyway. So maybe you can't even tell. But anyway. Yes. So um, I, I do see some of your friends um, are going on to YouTube off the invite. Um, and my friend Jason just said, you know, also, if any of your friends are trying to find us, if they go to Marshall Shore Hip Historian on Facebook, they can find you there as well. So that we can see that beautiful smile. I don't know if I 
can tell them, I'm afraid if I touch this other phone, I'm going to cut you off. Let me mm. see. I don't know. Like I said, I am the worst when it comes to this. Uh, I don't know. Well, maybe I can. I don't know. Anyway, you know me. I'm, I never ha knew you had to learn all this technology just to be in front <laughs> of the <world. laughs> until this all happened. And now I'm learning I can do a lot of things. I'm not good at them, but... Well, and also, just before I went on, I did share the link for Facebook Live onto your Facebook page. So it should be there. Okay. It's so just... I, I just checked on my phone and it's there, so... Okay. Well, that's good because I honestly... They talked me into buying this iPhone, which is the last thing I wanted. I had one a couple of years ago and I took it back. I have an Android and that's what I like, but they said no for filming. I do a little show. I've been doing my show... Pussy Loot and Friends ever since the pandemic. We're like in the 16th week of doing it from my house. And it's just me basically talking. And every now and then I'll have a guest. But they said, go buy an iPhone. Go buy an iPhone. It's the greatest thing since sliced bread. It's better than popcorn. <laughs> I got this iPhone and I can't even go back. I, it's like, I hate it. I hate it. I hate it. But I guess it films good. But we're not filming with it tonight. We're filming with my old Android from Metro PCS, so if I probably look pretty uh, smooth, because it's probably all filtered. <laughs> and then they said, well, they said, don't use the selfie camera. Use Turn it around. Well, when you turn it around, you can't see what you look right, like. Then you can't see anything. Ex exactly. I give up, honey. I just give up. Just be glad I'm sitting upright. For I now. I am. <laughs> oh, <my> God, <laughs> the night is young. God. A sip of tequila after all that. <laughs> Cheers, I agree. And maybe a little shot of Chanel number five, honey. Just uh. to boost my <laughs> boost my spirits. A little Chanel, baby. Get me through this night. And now my other phone is shut off. So that's it. But it'll come. <laughs> so anyway, thank you for having me tonight. It is an honor and a privilege. I haven't seen you since we did that lovely... I know oh. it's been so long. Well, it was like, wasn't it in February when we did that down it, at the library? We did that panel discussion. Yeah. So we did a panel discussion um, in honor of kind of World Days. It would have been January. And it was, we had entertainers talking about what it was like from the entertainment side going through the HIV AIDS crisis, which was really fascinating. And I will also send you the link also for that. So you can post that on your page so people can find yeah. you and see that yeah, panel. Well, Cause it was, it was really it interesting out that day, but I thought it was a really good thing. It was good. To, a couple of us, older entertainers um, sharing stories about, well, what is funny now they're calling us survivors. And I thought that was really strange. I never, never put two and two together in my life until right before that I have been contacted by someone writing a book asking for gay men in their fifties who had had, it was, this is the way they put it. It was looking for gay men who were sexually active with men in the, you know, and it's like, you are now considered an AIDS survivor. So it's like, well, like I said, I, like I said at the discussion, I am HIV negative. I don't know how in the world that happened. I don't know because I did some crazy stupid things back when I was younger. And, uh, but being called a survivor of that was pretty fascinating. And so I think it was fun to be here, especially when going through the scrapbook that I've pulled out um, for your show tonight because you asked me a couple of questions, I had to go back and the first two years <laughs> of my career, I kept really good scrapbook. Then I kind of petered off and I didn't, but just realizing that, oh my God, yeah, so many people are gone. And you kind of don't realize it till you flip through pages and page after page. Oh, he's gone. She's gone. They're gone. Oh. It's like, wow, it's kind of like a little wake up call. So, um, yeah, this has been fun. I haven't dug the scrapbook out in years. I know it was it was fun seeing some of those images. 
Yeah, when I first started about 40 years ago, well, I can tell you the whole back. I don't know if anybody knows me out there, if they want to hear the backstory. Give um, them the backstory. The version. Okay. But don't, get, don't give away any of the answers. I Well, I don't even remember the questions. And I, <laughs> they're on my phone, so I can't see them anyway. But I did know all the answers. I think there was one that was a trick question that I thought. And see, this damn iPhone turns off every couple of minutes, so I have to keep punching it in. But anyway, um, so I don't know if this even, I don't see. Well, I'm trying to read what people are saying, but this phone keeps turning off, but as long as this one's on. So anyway, for those of you who don't know me, I'm uh, Pussy LaHoot, a.k.a. Kevin McSweeney. I'm a native Arizonan, born and raised in Flagstaff, Arizona. Um, Coconino High School, class of 78. Yay, go Panthers. Had a very happy, wonderful childhood. Of course, I was a little bit different, but nobody really gave me problems with it or anything. I did get a few pick-ons in school, but I think everybody does, no matter what, for something other. There was a couple years that was pretty rough. But I had it a lot better than some of the other people. And um, so I didn't know what was different about me. I just knew I was different. Well, I had a very good friend growing up um, who was named Randy. We grew up a few houses down. We started kindergarten, went through all grade school together, who ended up being, you know, gay. And we were, like, best friends. Um, never had anything to do with each other. Gay men can have gay friends without having sex, believe it or not. Um, it's possible to have a gay best friend that you never slept with. And I've got many, many, many of them. Um, but anyway, he was just like my friend. And so we kind of went through this together. Well, he had been adopted. I found out I was adopted at age eight. Um, so we had a lot in common. Um, anyway, we snuck out of Flagstaff one weekend and we managed to come to Phoenix when we were about 16. And through one sort or another, we found a gay bar called Casa de Roma. And we were only 16 years old, probably going on 17. And we called the bar and they said, come on over. We're having a steak fry and a show. So we're like a show. We used to call going to the movies, going to the show. So I thought, oh, well, they must be playing a movie or something. <laughs> so dumb and so young from Flagstaff, didn't have a clue. So we went, and well, then we saw what the show was, and it's like, oh, well, you know, I kind of well, I want to do that. And then the went back to Flagstaff, had my senior year. That senior year in Flagstaff, I actually, um, in the thespian play of the year, I... Um, played the it, we did a melodrama and i was the star daisy i played the part daisy so i was like a scarlet o'hara type um it was very campy very comedy the girls played boys and the boys played girls and it was fun and it was um the first time i was in dragon everybody that was doing my makeup was like oh your eyes are so pretty your eyes are so pretty well i was thinking of the back of my head well i saw that show in phoenix i need to get down there and do that so the next got out of high school and me and that other friend, we snuck back to Phoenix and we went there and I entered a talent night. Not, and I was not going to have you stop there because that's one of the answers. Oh, it is. Okay. Well, I won't so, say where it was. I came to Phoenix and had a talent night where it, I lost. Um, I did Dolly Parton two doors down because I was a huge Dolly Parton fan from the time I first found her when I was about 13 or 14. I was obsessed with her. And so that is one of the trivia questions, right? It so is. I don't you you can ask it and I can answer it because I don't have it in front of me. No, nope, no worries. So basically, so, so Are you gonna basically ask it or do you want me to keep talking? Nope. Nope. I'm, I'm going to, I'm going to read the, uh, so I'm going to go through the answer. So I'm going to go through the questions. And so what I'm going to do is we're actually going to go through all 10 questions and then we have a little bit of a break and then we'll jump into those answers. So that way people okay, get a chance yeah, to kind to, of. Yeah. Anyway, so long story short, I moved to Phoenix. Um, 
October 15th, 1980, I won my first contest finally. I only entered two. And I consider that the beginning of my drag career. So this October 15th, it'll be 40 years doing drag, which is funny because in September of this year, I'll be turning 60. So I have a big year in front of me, but um, I have a whole plethora of history, how it was when I first moved here in 1981 and what bars we had and what it did and what it took to get through all this. And some of these are Marshall's questions tonight. Indeed. So, all right, everybody. So, if you've done our trivia before, you'll know that it's more about this story. And so, we'll ask 10 questions. You can keep track of your answer either on a pen and piece of paper, or you can type them here in the chat session. It's up to you. And we'll go through those first 10 questions. Now, they're all multiple choice. So, even if you don't have a clue what the answer is, you can take a guess and be 25% at least guaranteed you might be right. And then after that, we'll come back and we'll go through and talk about what those answers are and the stories behind those. Oh. All right. So let's see. All right. So let's get ready for some trivia. So our first question is, what event did Phoenix Pride start back in 1993? Was it A, lip sync for a dollar, B, the Pride March, C, Miss Phoenix pageant, or D, Jello wrestling? Which one of those did Phoenix Pride start back in 93? All right, so moving on to question two. Which one of these performers was a Miss Phoenix? A, Tish Tanner. B, Miss Ellie. C, Penelope Poupay. Or D, Miss Ebony. Which um, one of those the four? Is none of the above. <laughs> none, none of those were Miss Phoenix. You're asking which was a Miss Gay Phoenix pride. Oh, okay. I used the wrong wordage. Okay. Yes. Okay. Because none of those bitches were Miss Phoenix, honey. I'm a Miss Phoenix and none of them were. Oh, well, then you can tell us what the difference is. All right. Well, one is Miss Gay Phoenix and one is Miss Gay Phoenix Pride. <laughs> <That's what it's... laughs> All right. Where was the first drag contest that Pussy LaHoot entered? Was it A, Harpo's, B, Shamu's, C, 307, or D, Casa de Roma? Where was the first... Phoenix Drag con Contest that Pussy LaHoot entered. All right. And then where was her first hosting gig? Where did she actually get paid to host a show of drag queens? Was it A, Harpo's, B, Shamu's, C, 307, or D, C Casa de Roma? All right. Moving on to question five, which is the halfway point. What bar was known for DeGrazia murals? Was it A, Harpo's, B, Shamu's, C, 307, or D, Casa de Roma? Which one of those bars were net was known for DeGrazia murals? All right. Then where was the dressing room for the 307? Was it A, in the basement? Was it B, across the alley? C, was it upstairs? Or D, did they just use the bathroom? Where did all the performers get dressed at the 307? Where was that dressing room? And which performer now has a large dress form about 20 foot tall named for her? Is it A, Tish Tanner, B, Miss Ellie, C, Penelope Poupe, or D, Lady Cassandra? Which one of them has a really tall dress form named after her? All right, so going on to question eight, we're kind of in the home stretch here. 
what was the first LGBTQ newspaper in the Valley? Was it A, Echo, B, Arizona Gay News, C, Sunday's Child, or D, Tucson Observer? Which one of those was the first LGBTQ newspaper right here in the Valley of the Sun? All right, now we've got two more questions. Who was the headliner in 2001 Phoenix Pride Festival when a microburst canceled the event? Was it A, Dina Martina, B, Lady Bunny, C, Laverne Cox, D, RuPaul? Who was the headliner in 2001 when a microburst caused the festival to be canceled? And our last question, what hotel hosted a large LGBTQ Halloween party? Was it A, the San Carlos, B, the Erotica Motel, or C, Motel 6, or D, the Adams Hotel? Which one of those used to host a huge party back in the 80s? All right. So while everybody is getting their answers all set up, we have a little bit of Arizona music trivia for you all. And of course, this is going to be LGBTQ key themed as well. And so we actually start our story right here at the Arizona's Boys Ranch out in Chandler, which was, which was a facility that kind of took in homeless boys and cared for them and helped bring them up. Now, one of the interesting things is that it op when it opened in the 50s, one of the men running it had a son, um, Troy Walker. So Troy Walker grew up in Chandler, went into the Air Force, and was quickly discovered to have an amazing voice. And so his voice was so good that he wound up going on USO tours all over the globe. And then when he came back to Arizona, he moved to Hollywood, where he became the toast of Hollywood. He actually had two albums of him singing a variety of things from jazz. Now, you likely don't know him very well because his second album, Troy Walker Live, included a Judy Garland song called Happiness is Just a Thing Called Joe. Now, at that time, because it was a man singing about his love for another man, nobody would produce that record. He wound up having to have it self-produced, raising the funds himself to make that happen. Now, he also did other songs like The Marijuana Munchies, that was a big hit on shows like Dr. Demento and things like that. Now, he became such a music icon in, Arizona, in, in California that he would hang out with folks like Cher before she became famous and kind of helped nurture her along as well, as well as other celebrities as well. And last year they released a documentary called the original lady boy. Now he was performing actually at a country Western bar in Hollywood because of his voice. But when they would talk to him and say, well, he was extremely effeminate on stage. And they said, you know, how did you make that work? Especially in like the seventies and eighties in a country Western bar. He said, you know, he was always himself, his, his authentic self. And he would come on stage and things like, you know, mama wanted a girl, daddy wanted a boy, and they're both happy with me. And so he would come out on stage and just say things like that and, and go to town. And he last performed a couple of years ago. I've been trying to track him down to see if he's performing again. I know he was at the premiere of this movie back in Indianapolis last year. So we know he's still around. So I'm hoping I've been trying to talk to some folks about maybe bringing this movie to Arizona because I think it'd be really cool to see Troy Walker right here back home. All right. So who's ready for some answers and some maybe some fake answers because I got the question wrong. All right. <laughs> So our first I know how I've never heard of Troy Walker, but maybe I was partying or something in the eighties. I don't know. Well, you know, so, I mean, he performed, he was here in the seventies performing. He had moved to Hollywood in the sixties. 
Oh, well, honey, I was too young. So I was exactly, too young. you were too young, but he's still around singing. So I'm trying to track him down and hopefully hoping we can bring him back to Arizona. Oh, good Lord. That's all we need. That would be fun. It would be fun. I, I'm dying to see what's what's gone on all these few years. <laughs> that, would be, that would be exciting. I have a spare bedroom. Send him on over. Oh, very good. I, I did well like that. Mama wanted a boy. Daddy wanted a girl. I'm give them both. That's yeah. That's kind of that's yeah. kind of my life someday. <laughs> Yeah, I mean, he performed mainly in straight clubs. So that was where he basically built an audience. Well, didn't we all? Didn't we all? <laughs> all right. So our first question is, what event did Phoenix Pride start back in 1993? And it was the Miss Phoenix Pride pageant. And our current reigning Miss and Miss Phoenix Pride are Ty Marie and Owen Parker. So it's it's now a Mr. and Miss Pride pageant. It is. They've added. Well, actually, when I was Miss Pride in 1997, we had a Mr. His name was John Tigner. We didn't have a Miss. It was open, I think, if they wanted to do it. Um, I had a Mr. I haven't seen him in years. I think he's still around. But mostly it was predominantly Miss. Um. I don't remember when the women got involved, but I think it was right around the time I was. Um, loved the the contest. I almost thought you said Jello wrestling because I think Jello wrestling started around that same time too. I remember one of the very first Jello wrestlings in Phoenix was at Charlie's Phoenix, and a former Miss Gay Pride, Miss Ellie, who just passed away this week. Brought over all she had gotten every color of jello off the store shelves and mixed it all together and it didn't jello <laughs> jello apply. And if you mix green, orange, and all the colors of jello, you get brown. <laughs> Which was pretty, so I bet. These garbage <laughs> garbage bags of like really thick liquid that wasn't jello and it wasn't nothing. So we kind of did. And I did, and it was not on the sand at Charlie's, it was on the wooden deck behind Charlie's. And I, they, I said, I'll jello wrestle, I'll jello wrestle. This was 90 something. And uh, they teamed me up with a male stripper named Brown Sugar. That was his name. I, <laughs> it was his name. <laughs> <laughs> He got he was younger than me and bigger than me and stronger than me. And he got me out there and I came out Nancy Sinatra drag, blonde wig, Angora sweater, go go boots. He threw me down in that brown syrup. And as soon as I was in it, it all just absorbed into that wig and that sweater. So I weighed like a hundred pounds more than what I do. He flopped me around in there like a rag doll. And you know what? I, I've always said to this day, my back has never been the same. So there's a little extra boost for you folks out there. In TV <laughs> well, and also um, the F Miss Phoenix Pride pageant and Mr. It's um, for the scholarship. So that's all the money they raise goes into the scholarship, but then gets given away, which I think they're close to giving away almost like a million dollars this year after having it oh. for se several years. So they're doing quite well. Can oh I no! <laughs> Can I get some for all those years I stood out at Tempe soccer grounds, sweating my ass off in June for Gay Pride? No, it was fun. All right, and that's where that's where I won Miss Gay Pride in 1997. It was on the Tempe soccer fields, June. They did the evening gown competition, and the talent like. Okay, it's June right now. What's it outside? About 110. It was about yeah. like this on the Tempe soccer fields. I had a friend of mine. Her name was Mallory Essence. They literally, and I had another helper. They were literally taking one thing off me. Someone was toweling me down, putting on the next dress, and I literally just walking, and oh, it was miserable. These oh kids, my gosh. Oh, these kids don't know how good they have it today. 
But anyway, I digress. Go on. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So which one of these performers was a Miss Phoenix Pride winner? Oh, I might you gave it away. Yeah, you did. It was Miss Ellie. Well, wait, I was, I mentioned a few people, so Mallory well, could have been. Right. It could have been several of them, I mean, and so, yeah, we had a list of folks, and so the answer was B, Miss Ellie, and you're right, she did just pass away. Yeah, she passed away this week, which is shocking, because we're kind, kind of around the same age, so that hits a little close to home, plus we're contemporaries, we were around the same time, we were actually neighbors, we had an apartment complex at 12th Street in Medlock, right behind the dealership there, the car dealership, not the drug dealership, the car dealership. <laughs> and uh, it was called, we called it Medlock Place because at the time in the 90s, there was a show on some network called Melrose Place. And it was the steamiest like drama. It was so, everybody's like, oh, I can't go out tonight. Melrose Place is on. It was before DVRs and all that bullshit. And so nobody would go out on this particular night. So we called our place Medlock Place. Tish lived there, Miss Ellie, me, Cindy Miller, our some of our very first transsexual girls, Bob Donna, Alicia, we had Veronica Lake. Plus a, a lot of assorted crazy people lived there. Sometimes we do shows by the pool, but that was called Medlock Place. So yeah, Miss Ellie did win. And when she was Miss um arizona or miss arizona pride or phoenix pride what they called it back then we went to san francisco a big contingency of us from winks and we went up there and it was tish and me and miss ellie were the only three drag queens and that's a whole nother chapter in a book that we'll write at a later <laughs> date i need a i need a writer I'm going to just start talking into a tape recorder. I got them. I ordered it on Amazon. There they are over there. Um, I need a writer. Who wants to write my life story? Get a hold of me. I'm very easy to find. Call BR549. <laughs> and you'll get junior samples, shockingly enough. Yes. <laughs> what is my used car? hee <laughs> All right. And where was your first drag contest that Pussy LaHood entered? D, Casa de Roma. And you didn't win. I was crushed. Oh, it was Casa de Roma. Yeah, I'm sorry. I thought you were going to run down all the answers. Oh, um, no. But yeah, the answer. it was Casa de Roma. <laughs> I didn't win. 17 years old, crushed, worked so hard. To, I really didn't work so hard. I had a Kmart dress and probably a Kmart wig. I don't remember where I got the hair. But we did lie a lot and sneak down, get to Phoenix. We had to get a hotel room. Um, and I actually, the ironic thing is, if anyone knows anything about drag in Arizona, that night I lost to another newcomer, Penelope Poupe, who became very famous and was a le living legend. She's gone now, but her legacy has lived on in Phoenix forever and ever. Um, Penelope won that night doing Frankenfurter. I did a really sad Dolly Parton two doors down. Um, but I did meet a friend that's still alive today, Tony Bartoli, a bartender. He hangs out at the bunkhouse when, when things are open and we're not in lockdown. Um, Tony served me my first beverage because i was 17 he goes well we give all the girls in the show a free drink and i he goes what would you like and i go and i didn't even know a drink it's so crazy but i remembered my mom one new year's eve we went out to dinner and they my dad's boss made everybody order a drink and my mom didn't drink so she ordered a tom collins so I said, well, I'll have a Tom Collins. And that's like gin and sweet and sour. They're not bad. But after a couple of them, that all gin and sweet and sour starts building up on the back of your throat. You just want to, you know, hawk, hawk something <laughs> up. But anyway. Um, and so, so was that 40 years ago that you won that? No, that was more. I don't consider that when I started drag. I consider, okay. so then after that I was, well, I wasn't 
I was a little crushed, but I had to go back home. And then I went, you know, my family was living at Grand Canyon. I moved back to Flagstaff to go to beauty school. During beauty school, I got a chance to come back. Casa Jerome had closed and became Harpo's. Harpo's. I have my little scrapbook page of everything. Um, Because we only had one newspaper at the time. So every two weeks, this paper came out. And I would clip everything for the first year or two out. But anyway, um, so when I came back to town, Casa was closed. It was over there across from that baseball park on Indian School, about three or four blocks north. There is a street called Roma, but Casa was, I think, on Turney. Ah, okay. And uh, it was later the Barbizon School of Modeling, modeling Parking Lot. How ironic. <laughs> and, <laughs> and, um, so when I got back to Phoenix, they said, oh, no, Harpo's is now, or Casa de Rome is now called Harpo's. It's over there on Central and, and McDowell, which is now, actually, it's First Avenue and McDowell. And the it's the parking lot of the Lung Association. As least last time I was down there was, I don't know what's happened down there now. Since Easley's closed, I don't get down to McDowell much. But anyway, so that's where I went and won my second one. And that's when I won my very first talent contest. It was two weeks before the presidential election of 1980 when Ronald Reagan was running. So it was October 15th, 1980. It was called Showtime Shambles on a Wednesday night. And Penelope, believe it or not, had come so far in that year. She was working right. She was the hostess of Showtime Shambles, which was the name of the talent night. And Goldie O'Brien was the her cohort of the night. And there was like four or five of us contests. And I had a present or a t-shirt that said Pussy for Prez. Because it was a presidential election. And then two weeks later, Ronald Reagan won. That was 1980. I was in beauty school. And that was like a, six months before I moved to Phoenix. So that was the first time I won and I got paid a little bit of cash. I don't even remember what it was. Okay. But anyway, I consider that the first time I got paid in drag. So that's my drag anniversary. So this October 15th will be 40 years in show business. Wow. Le- legitimate show business. And an illegitimate show business. <laughs> All right. So question four, where was Pussy Loose first hosting gig? The Shamus. Yeah. So I moved back to Phoenix the day I got out of beauty school, which was about um, August 1981. Became fast and fierce friends with Tish. She became my drag mother. Hired me on at Harpo's for $25 every two nights. So I had to work $12.50 a night. Um, there was just, they, you know what, looking back, they said there was no money, but there was money. We were just stupid. And I was young, and I just wanted to be on stage. I didn't care. So then anyway, in November of that year, Harpo's closed. And every drag queen was out of work. So the little bar over on 24th Street and Thomas Shamu's invited everybody to come to work. So we all trotted over there. And they said, well, the order of the oldest, one, two, three, four. And I was like the fifth girl. So I had to run the spotlight for a few months. But I was in drag and I was in show business and I was happy. Then Tish decided to move to, she got a, big offer to go to like Sammy's. They were going to like double her salary, which was probably like $75 or maybe a hundred. I don't know. And they brought me down out of the spotlight, put me in the show a couple weeks later, something happened, put me on the microphone. Joanne, who was a great, great old drag queen from Phoenix. She was bartending and managing there. And they put me on the microphone and I just, because somebody wasn't ready and I just grabbed it and they just said, well, Joanne says, oh my God, 
that pussy LaHoot, she's funny. She needs to be on the mic. She's going to be the next Sissy Goldberg, who was a big deal at the time. Um, so the rest was history by um, November. I know I think for that thing says October because it was Halloween. Yeah. And you had asked me the name of the show and Tish had started the name of that show and all that drag because that was from Chicago and all that jazz. <laughs> Way 20 years before the movie, there was a Broadway play called Chicago and it was very gay and very la la la. But anyway, so yeah, that was the name of the show. You asked me that question last night and I did not know that's what made me drag out this scrapbook. Yeah. No, and that's great. Taking, taking me down memory fucking lane. But yeah, that was it. So my first hosting gig, and I put some pictures on Facebook today. You can go to Kevin McSweeney or Pussy LaHoot, but go to Kevin McSweeney and you can look up and see some of my old things. I'm going to try to photograph this whole scrapbook really quick because it's deteriorating. Oh my Just gosh, like yeah, no, that would be great. I mean, I would love to see what all is in there. I mean... It's like yeah. with with the doing a lot of the Arizona gay history. It's like that would be right up there with. It was only the first, like the first two years, we only had like the one publication. So I always, every week, cut it out, put it in this photo album. But a lot of the pages are like, I don't know what happened. They're like curling up and they're turning brown. And this was the one picture that uh, I did get out of it, and it's fun. I put it on my Facebook today. Of all the bars of 82, or at least the ones that I knew about, and it's crazy because none of them are around today. But anyway, sorry, on with the next. All right, question five. What bar was known for DeGrazia murals? And that would be the 307. And here we have a photo of Pussy at the 307 as well as Miss Ebony at the 307. Yes, and we're right in front of some of those. Well, they were on two of the walls. The one long wall had many murals, and that one in front of me was right in the middle of the bar. They called those the Dancing Ladies. And when we first did a couple shows down there before they really took off, Lady Cassandra came back to town and she said, let's do a Monday morning madness show. I can make money for you. And so she did. But they just put like four cases of beer. But if you know, if you worked in the bar, Budweiser bottle beers come in like a case and it's very sturdy. They put like four of those together with some plywood on top. And that's what I'm standing on. And I'm in front of the DeGrazia dancing girls. Let's see. Ebony, I think, yeah, is right in the same place. Yeah, she's in the exact same spot. Yeah. And then there, I have a picture. Later, they moved the stage to one end of the bar. Then they moved it to the back. I worked up through zone about three different times. Early 80s, late 80s, and then the very, very bitter end at the 1999. Um, wow. But yeah. Grazia had painted those pictures. We have a lot of conflicting stories. I had heard he paid it to pay off a bar tab. You had heard he paid it off just to drink for free. Well, basically, it's the same thing. So I guess the story is all cheap booze. Booze. He was working for cheap booze. Yeah, it was a building. It was a straight bar for years. And before that, it was a drugstore. I think they said it was a Walgreens. Um, the old owner, James Harrison, okay. told me that. So anyway, it's very exciting, and I forgot to bring them out. But when I when I heard they were demolishing it, I did go out there, <laughs> pulled up, walked up to the chain link fence, and one of the construction workers came over. He was the foreman, actually. He was very nice to me. I said I used to work here. I was a drag queen, and he's like, "Oh, I heard this was a really good place." and he gave me like five of the bricks and he, I have some crumbled pieces that are that turquoise back there. And I have a couple of pieces that have the gold brush strokes, but I don't know what they were all the same color. Um, so I have some of that crumbled and I gave some of it to some of the girls that I knew that had worked there. 
But yeah, I have a couple of bricks. And I told him, I said, hey, did you find the basement yet? He was like, there's a basement in here? I said, oh yeah, that's where they hid the bodies, honey. <laughs> well, and with that's the murals. They always heard. They said, do you want to come back to the back? He goes, he goes, you don't like your salary? Come to the back. That was like, that was <laughs> I always heard there was a basement back there where there was bodies, but actually it was just a cellar where they kept beer and stuff to keep it cool. But the, the, con, what do you call the guy that tears down the building? The demolition guy didn't know there was a basement. So he was anxious to find it after I left. So we <laughs> each got something. <laughs> right. Well, I know with the murals, they actually tried to actually his museum came up from Tucson to try and save the ballerina that was back behind the stage. They tried to move it, but those things it's, were so yeah. I, you can you can see the um, pieces I have. It's not even like what we call drywall today. I don't know what it is. It's just a thin little. Well, yeah, I guess it, was the, it is a drywall, but yeah, it just yeah. yeah I think you, it was really just plaster kind of on the wall i mean it was like and so that was the only one that wasn't right on the bricks so as soon as they pulled it up from the wall it next, just shattered next time, sometime we'll do a a whole show on the 307 in downtown phoenix and i'll bring those out because i still have a few i haven't given them all out okay yeah it was so that was such an interesting place boy three like five times during my life when i first went heard about it and went down there. I thought it was a rough old honky tonk and I was from Flagstaff and I was afraid to go down there. Then one time I was working there. Then another time I was 86 out of there. Then another time I was working there. Then it was like, oh my God, it was on and on. It was always a drama place. But you know what? I was looking at those pictures today and it was a home. It was a home for a lot of people. So you got to give that up because there's a lot of right. people in this world who need a home. And that was awesome. Right. All right. Where was the dressing room for the 307? Because it was such a small place. Why, it was B across the alley. Alley, parking lot, whatever you call it. It was an alley, but it was also the parking lot. And yes, we had to run across the dressing room to that little... I don't even know what it was. They said it was an apartment at one time. It had a kitchen and a bathroom, but they were non-functional. But it was like a little room. I hear now it's a, or before the pandemic, it was a restaurant. I hear it's only like 150 square feet. It's a little oh. tiny place. Um, they did add a back patio onto it. But yeah, so I mean, but what was great, the owners actually kept the name of the dressing room to keep up that history of what it used to be. Yeah, that's amazing. I was, before the pandemic, I was going to go down there. Well, actually, I didn't, I don't know. But yeah, we used to cross that parking lot, rain, shine, 120 degree weather, uh, rain, whatever. Phoenix has a great thing. We would run across that thing. We'd also have to dodge people. There would be people always coming through there trying to pick up, you know, um, pick up a quickie because that was kind of the prostitute area, the male hustler area. You'd get guys cruising there. We had one owner there at the end. He stood like with a gun at the door and he's squatting, get out of my parking lot. And we were running across the thing, and Barbara Seville would be sucking on a great pucker. No, she did apple pucker. I did great. It was crazy. <laughs> it was crazy. It did have air conditioning, and it didn't have any leaks. And I don't know. It was it was something. Just it another was. another crazy moment of my life. It was indeed. And so which performer has a large dress form named for her? And that would be Tish Tanner. Down in the alley, just behind their dressing room, they have installed a 20-foot tall dress form that is dripping with about 10,000 LED lights. And so when they named it Tish Tanner because it was big and noticeable, just kind of like she was. 
yeah, that's my drag mother. I cannot deny that, honey. She was big. Um, when I saw it, it was up on the street because it was like the unveiling and stuff. I w actually got to go down with um, the ma the mayor and um, everything went down there for the dedication. The 307 has been torn down. It's a nice like five um, story condo, something right. that if you put all of us who ever worked there together during those times, we couldn't afford to live there. Um, there's a nice bronze or whatever you call it plaque on the sidewalk that said this was the site of 307. And there it is. And I did go down for that unveiling and I went up with um, Greg Stanton. Mm -hmm. He was the man at the time. We had a lovely rooftop garden with some wine and stuff. And that dress form was outside. I didn't know they had nicknamed it Tish, but I think that couldn't be better to honor my drug mother because that's the one who kind of gave me my beginning. And so I think it's awesome. If you get down there, pay homage because those days are gone. It's now all artsy, fartsy, restaurant-y, apartments and condos I couldn't afford to live in. And so that's kind of kind of nice. The old girl made a a swing around, honey. Well, and that was part of the reason why we, why we did um, the Arizona LGBT Plus History Project did the plaque was because that history was quickly going away, and really between Cruz and Central and really three hundred seven, it's like that was kind of what made the neighborhood. Oh, honey, yes, they used to, but we used to, well, when I first went to the Rose 7, I was scared to death. Um, Tish took me down there one night, and I thought I had heard how rough it was. People were stabbed. There was, you know, all this kind of crazy shit going on. <laughs> and then I had learned very quickly that, oh, no, this is a fun place. Then we learned about Cruising Central, and started going over there and it, it was about two blocks away so we'd walk none of us probably had money for cab fare or there probably wasn't any cabs around and that was the hustler prostitute area so we loved it walking through excuse me you made a lot of friends with the boys on the street and let's face it the boys on the street became friends with the girls of the night we were the girls of the night and, you know, we tried to help each other. And so um, it was a lot of fun. And I never felt unsafe walk around there because I knew all the hustlers would get me from 307 to run down to Cruising Central to run back to 307 for last call. I didn't have a care in the world because I knew every hustler on every corner knew me. And if they would come into the bar, I'd try my best to get them a drink if I couldn't buy them one myself. And I probably couldn't in the days because money was so tight. But I always kept gum in my purse and mints. And the hustlers always liked that. And this was way, 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 way before. I don't know why. <laughs> I was going to say this was way before safe sex but maybe not this might have been on the verge of safe sex because I honestly don't remember I sent you the thing today that the first time we yeah we had an AIDS fundraiser um, so I don't know I honestly don't remember when the break was. I don't know if there was a huge thing. I remember having a benefit for muscular dystrophy in 1982 and then an AIDS fundraiser in the spring of 83. And I just don't know. You asked me and I'm trying to look, search my mind and my um, scrapbook. But I honestly don't remember when happened the first uh, AIDS fundraiser. I know we were hearing about it 
But like I told you at that panel discussion, I hope we'll be able to get together soon, Marshall, and do this again, and we can I explore more of this. Yeah, no, so I, I agree. Running, I know you're running over time, and I've That's taken okay. up way too much of your time. That's okay. No worries. All right, so question eight. What was the first LGBTQ newsletter newspaper in the Valley? And that was B, Arizona Gay News which was 1975 when it started. The first one in the state was actually down in Tucson. And then shortly after that, the AGN started. And so when I think that the observer was in Tucson and they ran that thing for years, Mm -hmm. Bob Clark, and he ran that thing till the day he died. And that was always fun, but we had the AGN. It was it wasn't called the Arizona Gay News. It's called the AGN, and it was a newspaper, just like these papers. So every two weeks, you got a little newspaper, and you read it. It's not like the magazines now and all that bullshit. Which I love the magazines; they're fun. But it was like a little getting a newspaper, and you got to remember there was no cell phones, no, no internet. Texts. No, getting on the Facebook and saying, hey, bitch, guess what happened? Every two weeks, you picked up a paper. And you said, oh, my God, so-and-so died. So-and-so died. This is when we knew AIDS was coming around. Oh, my God, five people died of AIDS in this two-week span that this paper came out. And, oh, my God, Pussy LaHoot did a benefit, yada, yada, yada. That's all the news we had. Unless right. you're one of the lucky ones who might have had a telephone and you just gossiped every night, but most of us couldn't even afford a phone. I remember when I lived at Faggot Flats, that was the name of it. There was nine apartments down on 3rd Street in Roosevelt. It was called Faggot Flats. We had a pay phone by the pool. It would ring. <laughs> and it was like two rings for the lesbian, three rings for Pussy LaHoot, four rings for Magnolia. It was like funny and people just can't b- understand we just didn't have that i mean i guess in the 40s they had telegrams and that was horrible if you got a telegram but we were just like but that was it that was it if that phone rang after midnight at faggot flats you knew something bad had happened and I hate to say that, but I can say that because that was my nickname in high school. So there you go. <laughs> hey, we, I think we had the same nickname. Shocking. I know. <laughs> All right. Question nine. Who was the headliner in 2001 when Phoenix Pride Festival had a microburst and canceled the event? And Just that was... Go, no, you... go ahead. <laughs> my, my favorite person so but you know i mean at that point it was like i mean phoenix pride was trying to really do something big and by getting her this was long before drag race or any of that had ever happened yeah right and so it's like it was, I down- was there i got hit hit i got hit in the head by a tent flying across that. But I still went out and did my number. Yes, I'm just kidding. No, I'm not (laughs) kidding. Me and Lady Cassandra actually got crushed in a tent when the microburst hit. They're waiting for, just do the answer right now. It was RuPaul. RuPaul was supposed to come from the hotel down across under the bridge. What's that called? Martha Washington? What's that? What's her her governor's name? Margaret Hans Park. Margaret oh, Hans. Yeah. Margaret yeah. Hans, Martha Washington, who gives a fuck. <laughs> so she was supposed to walk down through there and get on stage. So I'm standing on this stage, powdering my nose, and all I hear this whop. <laughs> I get hit in the side of the head by a tent and Lady Cassandra. It knocked my earring off my ear, knocked this one off. I never found the earrings. Oh, my but God. It, it, they said, well, cancel. Well, yeah, that's worse than anything. So they canceled the event. And then I don't even know. I I don't even know RuPaul ever even left her hotel room. 
I think she was too worried about it, honey. She might have loosened up some of her uh, tape, you know. That <laughs> but anyway, that was that was RuPaul. Yes. All right. And then our last question is, what hotel hosted a large LGBTQ Halloween party? And it's D, the Adams. And, but, you know, I was looking at my papers and it all says the Hilton. Well, so because I there were know, in, in the I early 80s. The, I don't know if the Adams changed to the Hilton or the Hilton changed it, to the it, Adams or... Well, it was the Adams Hotel, and there were a couple of years in the mid in the early '80s where it did become the Hilton. Yeah, and now today it's still there, but the it's still, still there. There. it's that hotel has always changed names. It should be called the La Hoot. <laughs> well, you know, there's been a hotel there since the late 1890s. There's always been a hotel there. Yeah, and I always called it the Adams Hotel because it was on Adams and. Right, that was, that was the original yeah. two hotels were the Adams, and then so yeah, so, so it's, it's we said, where's the Halloween ball? It's at the Adams Hotel, so we just call it that. But when I sent you those pictures, it says the Hilton, so I guess in '82 it became the Hilton, yes. and people still called it the Adams. I well, don't yeah. know. Yes, I mean, I, I think everybody still called it the Adams. I mean, I've run into people today who still call it the Adams, even though I that was still it years the Adams. ago. It's the right. hotel downtown on Central Meadows with the honeycomb windows. Exactly. And so you said this is a Halloween party to end all Halloween parties. Yeah, that was the biggest thing in um, Phoenix for gay. It was like there was no gay pride. There was no Miss Gay Phoenix, no Miss Gay Arizona. There was nothing. Halloween ball was all we had. And every year they had a big contest and it was at a big hotel. And as I was looking at this, there was a group of men. I think I know most of them. It was says sponsored by or whatever. Um, I kind of call them the gay mafiosa. I think they're all dead. So no one's going to hit me through the thing. But anyway, so I don't know what was going on, but there was no product sponsors. You know, back in the old days, um, we kind of sponsored ourselves. I never had a corporate sponsor. I don't remember. I remember when there was no corporate sponsors. We just kind of had to come up with things. And actually, the drag queens probably funded the first two years of AIDS money and everything. And I I can say the drag community, but it was 98.9% drag queens. Um, there was only a handful of us. And I just think it's crazy. We had no corporate sponsors, but we seemed to raise money and do what we needed to do. These Halloween balls were put on by individual men. I think they were out to make a profit. There were like three gay men that made a thing. They were wealthy. They put it on. But it was one thing to do, and I think it was awesome. So I just don't know. I... I was 20 years old when I got here. So I, and I was from Flagstaff. So I didn't understand the ways of the game and everything. I just went, hey, yeah, hey, yeah. Someone said, hey, you know. So that was me. All right. Well, thank you so much for being on this evening. And sharing in our special gay pride edition of Arizona History Happy Hour. So your show is on Sunday night. I'm I'm still doing a show. Um, after forty years, I had my first twenty years in the <laughs> metropolitan com com Phoenix community. Here's bars I've worked. Then. 
just when I was going to retire, I started a second chapter at Charlie's Phoenix. And uh, now I'm kind of like on my third um, third little jig. I'm doing these um, virtual shows. So this week will be their 16th week. So yeah, I'm just Facebook Live, Kevin McSweeney or Pussy LaHoot. Look for me on Facebook Live. You can subscribe to me on YouTube because we're going to eventually have to move to YouTube Live. Um, it's free. Just go do it. Um, but yeah, I'm doing that because we're still not going to be, be able to open bars and stuff and be close to people. We might be able to open bars, but you can't do what we do. And for drag, I think we got to be right there near you and in your face. Cause that's what everybody loves. Um, or doesn't, maybe they don't. But anyway, stay tuned. Yeah, look for me. I hope you have me back, Marshall. I'd love to do a round two. We've got more. We oh only barely gosh. made it through. We only made it barely through 1981. I know, and there's so much more we've got to cover. I'll come back. I'll be happy anytime. All right, very good. Thank you so much, and have a great rest of your night. And enjoy that strawberry margarita that was delivered to your door. I'm so jealous. I know, by, Mil by Bill Jackson from The Wave. Good night, everybody. Thank you. Stay safe. Stay home. Wear a mask. <laughs>All right, so we're coming towards the end of our show. So we have our segment called Little Arizona. And so basically, when you look at Arizona, it's like, you know, we have the fifth largest city in the country. But I think what really makes Arizona such a unique place are really all the small towns around. And so one of, my, one of the small towns we're going to talk about tonight is called Ray, Arizona. So Ray, Arizona was a mining town started. I mean, they started doing the mining in like the late 1800s. And by 1909, there indeed was a small town there. Now they were doing underground mining. And so people actually were able to live in the town. I mean, here you can see this is World War I. They're practicing first aid. And it was quite a thriving little town. But then it's like as time moved on, they decided that they would actually do pit mining. And they wound up having to move the town about 20 miles to Kearney. So all the folks that were living there, including the folks that were interned in the cemetery, were all moved to this small town called Kearney, Arizona. Now, the reason why we're talking about this is because there was a young man. Um, last name was Graf. He was actually born in ray arizona wound up becoming moving to hollywood when he was with his family early on but he became the director of a writer and producer of a mag of a movie called teenagers from outer space and so that movie became kind of one of those almost very ed wood like classics because now it was rumored that one of his stars in that movie actually he was romantically involved with and that would be David Love. He then went on and wound up doing a couple other movies in Hollywood, did some work on a movie called Wizard of Mars, but then wound up actually trying to change his name to Jesus Christ too, which that didn't happen. And then several years later, he actually wound up committing suicide. And one of the big factors behind that was because he had been kind of shunned by the whole Hollywood crowd. Um, he was a very out gay man at this time period, and that was not acceptable in Hollywood. And so that's pretty much what did him in. So that is our Ray Arizona bit of history. Oh, and there is David Graff, what he looked like when he was filming some of his movies. He was indeed a cutie. And so before we jump off to that, let's see if... All right. Nope. Let's try this. All right. So okay. 
Okay. Well, you know what we're going to do? So this is the trans flag. So this actually flag was designed 21 years ago right here in Phoenix by Monica Helms. And so she actually wound up coming to Pride last year and becoming one of the Grand Marshals. She also has recently written a book called More Than Just the Flag. She was in the military and is still very much an advocate and very much a rebel. But I love how she designed the flag that is now seen across the globe. She did that right here in Arizona. So now if you have any questions, suggestions, stories you would like to see covered here, you're more than happy to reach out to me or comments as well. So I also am with the Arizona LGBT History Project. And so we do a lot of different things. And so that's part of the reason why we put on tonight's show. Um, tomorrow, there will actually be a walking tour coming out that is written. That's going to be on a blog post as well as then a little other piece that actually is an online piece. You can take that tour either virtually or in the privacy of your own home. And so... Now, with this project, it's actually part of Phoenix Pride as well as ASU. So the second newsletter here in the Valley was called Sunday's Child, and that was BJ Bud's newsletter. And so ASU has in the pro been in the process of doing a lot of scanning of those early periodicals so that folks can have access to those. So they're in the process of working on that. And so that's why I definitely want to get with Pussy Lahoot after seeing her scrapbook and make sure we get copies of that in because there's so much that we don't have information on. And that's part of fun. I mean, even tonight, she was saying things that I had never heard before. So there's always stories to learn and share. We've been done a variety of oral histories with ASU and some other folks as well. So I know there'll be more from that in the future. I also am part of the Arizona Vintage Sign Coalition. We talk about basically vintage signs across Arizona. If you'd like to reach out, you can do that. Here's how you can, um, on email, you can also check out on Facebook, Marshall Hip Historian, or also you can join or friend AZ Gay History. And so that's all the stuff we're doing. We push out through there, the different events. We'll be working on, um, we've been doing for the last few years in September, a banned book reading. So we'll be pursuing that as well. And also, if you'd like to donate money, you can do that through Venmo. You can find me at Marshall Shore. Oops, I didn't change that. So next week, oh my gosh, it's so exciting. Because the 4th of July, I have a friend who actually is one of the pyrotechnic folks that lights off the fireworks at Tempe Lake. So he's going to be on talking about kind of the history of fireworks and some of that stuff, as well as he has an amazing history because his family have... The, They've been a lot of mining inspectors. So that's going to be a really fun show as well, talking about a wide variety of things. And so again, thank you all so much for being here. Now, don't forget, if you'd like to help support the show, you can do that through Venmo. Um, or you can also become a sponsor like AARP of Arizona. So the coronavirus continues to affect us all. We may be apart, but we are not alone. AARP is here in Arizona providing information that can help you and your family. And their website is aarp.org backslash AZ. So you can find more information there. So again, everyone, thank you all so much for being here. I mean, I can't believe we've been now doing this 11 weeks um, and we're going to continue on for quite some time. It looks like that. So. Thank you so much for being here and everyone have a great rest of your evening.